What is predestination? Well, it's one of those strange words that, on the one hand, there's a dispute inside the church about whether or not it's even real, despite the fact that, well, the Bible uses the word and talks about it as if it's real. At the end of the day, the actual dispute is about the nature of predestination. And the two questions are these. One, everybody agrees that God knows the future. And so some argue that to say that God predestines, that is, determines in advance where people will end up in eternity, some say he makes that determination on the basis of his foreknowledge of who would believe and who would not. And so God predestines to salvation those that he sees as he looks down the corridor of time uh, will come to saving faith. Uh, the other view, the uh, historic Protestant view, the uh, Reformed view holds that those uh, that when God looks, well, that God chooses on the basis of his own good pleasure, not on his foreseeing who would choose him, that apart from his grace, if he were to look down the corridor of time, no one would believe. At the end of the day, the issue comes down to uh, whether or not a, uh, we have within ourselves the capacity even to come to faith apart from the grace of God, or whether or not God has to act first. And then secondly, about the nature of God's choice. Now, the advantage of the foreknowledge view is that it removes from God uh, any accusation that he doesn't treat everybody the same. And the other view, that's absolutely true. The other view, God doesn't treat everybody the same. The downside to the foreknowledge view is that it seems to suggest that some people are better than others, that those that God sees would choose him are essentially the, the better people, and those that he sees will not are the worse people. And so those who do come to saving faith have reason to boast. Now, it's my contention that as you read through the Word of God, you can see quite clearly uh, that God affirms over and over again, A, that faith is a gift from him, and that that gift is, cannot be given to everyone or everyone would have saving faith. And so he gives the gift to some and not to others. But as a gift, it not only tells us what's necessary for us to get to that place, but it also tells us that it's not something that comes from us. Now that said, even those of us who believe in this more uh, vigorous understanding of predestination, uh, we recognize that it's we who believe, we who trust, we who rest. But that is what happens when you receive a gift. Once you receive it, it's yours. So our Heavenly Father gives those that he has predestined the gift of faith, and they believe, they trust, they rest, they turn to Christ for their salvation. Predestination is always difficult for people to swallow because not only does it seem to cast a shadow on God, though it doesn't, because God never treats anybody unfairly. He gives everybody at the very least justice, and he reserves the right to show mercy to whom he will show mercy. Uh, but secondly, it exposes the depth and the scope of our own sin. Now, friends, I don't believe that you have to believe in predestination, the more rigorous kind, in order to get into heaven. We get into heaven when we trust in the finished work of Christ alone, not when we properly understand how that happened. So please don't misunderstand. This is a secondary issue, but it's a secondary issue that the scripture speaks to. And we should not be afraid to speak of it as well. It doesn't keep us from calling, as it doesn't keep God himself, from calling all men everywhere to repent. Because one thing we know, that whether God did it by looking down the corridor of time or whether God did it by his own good pleasure, uh, those who have been predestined do not come with a big neon P on their forehead so that we know who they are and who is not among the predestined. <clears throat> So from that, we go out and we call all men everywhere to repent. Mm -hmm.